Well, hello there. Hello there. It's wonderful uh, to be here with you uh, guys uh, in Lake Tahoe. Um, thank you so much for asking me uh, back again. Uh, can't believe that it's been a whole year. It has, but anyway, uh, wonderful to be here, and it's again wonderful to be uh, the sandwich filling uh, in between uh, two wonderful uh, speakers that we have with us today, Mark and Patricia. So, um, and hopefully the music that I'm going to share with you will give time for thought and amplify some of the wonderful um, thoughts and healings that uh, they're going to be sharing with us today. So I'm going to kick off with um, a song called All Glory Be to God Most High. And the, the words um, are by a, an English uh, writer. Uh, and uh, deep thinker and Christian scientist, Violet Hay. All glory be to God most high And on the earth be peace The angels sang in days of yore A song that will never cease Till all the world knows peace Till all the world knows peace God's angels ever come and go All winged with love They bring us blessings from on high They lift our thoughts above They whisper they whisper, God is love. All glory be to God most high. And on the earth be peace. And on the earth be peace. Oh, longing hearts that wait on God Through all the world so wide He knows the angels that you need And sends them to your side To comfort God and guide To comfort God and guide Glory be to God most high And on the earth be peace Oh, wake, wake and hear that angel song That bids all discord cease From pain and sorrow, doubt and fear Brings a sweet release, and so our hearts find peace, and so our hearts find peace. All glory be to God most high, and on the earth be peace. The angels sang in days of yore A song that will never cease Till all the world knows peace Till all the world knows peace Till all the world knows peace. 
continuing on with the theme of love. This is a poem called Love by the discoverer and founder of Christian Science, Mary Baker Eddy. Sheltering wind, neath which our spirits blend, like brother birds that soar and sing, and on the same branch bend the arrow that doth wound the dove, darts not from those who are to love. Darts not from those who watch and love. If thou the bending reed wouldst break by thought or word unkind, pray that his spirit you partake, who loved and healed mankind. Seek holy thought. And heavenly strain that make men one. Seek holy thoughts and heavenly strain that make men one. In love remain. Then to that wisdom's rod is given. Faith to kiss and know that greetings glorious from high heaven whence joy's supernal flow come from that love divinely near which chastens pride and earthborn fear through God who gave. That word of might which swelled creation's lay. Let there be light, and there was light what chased the clouds away. Twas love whose finger traced aloud a bow of promise. Ah. him strong how can we learn to sing his song he told us I am the light of the world I am the light of the world so follow me and shine out for I am the light of the world who are we why are we here what is our purpose in living? Our 
little flame seems small beside the brightness of his giving. He told us you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. So follow me and shine out. For you are the light of the world. His God is our God. His light is our light, His power is here to bless us all, His Father is our Father too, so we can never fail nor fall. He told us we are the salt of the earth, yes we are the light of the world. We follow Him when we shine out, for we are the light of the world. His light is our light, His power is here to bless us all, His Father is our Father too, so we can never fail nor fall. He told us we are the salt of the earth, yes we are the light of the world, we follow Him we shine out, for we are the light, He is the light. is the light of the world. Christ is the light of the world. Yes, He is the light of the world. Continuing on with the um, with that theme of love, this is a poem by a playwright and a poet, uh, an American uh, called uh, William Luce, and he uh, he wrote um, he wrote some uh, wonderful plays, um, which uh, produced quite a lot in the United States, and uh, he was a, a very deep very deep thinker and he wrote a marvelous collection um, of, of poems that he he had put to music by um, a Christian science teacher um, Martin Bruners uh, and I just loved some of the poems that uh, he's, he's left uh, in his legacy and um, so this is one of them it's called the tide of love and it fits in very well with the with the talk that we've uh, we're going to be having uh, later, and also the the situation in in our local communities, and in the in the wider world. The tide of love. Will wash the world like the April rain that melts the snow. The tide of love will flood the heart with a deep and fervent overflow. The tide of love will wash the world. Tide of love will heal the world. Be strong and face the rising tide. Let courage be your star and song. Let the crystal rays of purity cleanse your heart of every wrong. The 
tide of love will wash the world like the April rain that melts that snow. The tide of love will flood the hearts with a deep and fervent overflow. The tide of love will wash the whole world. The tide of love will heal the world. In God, in God there is no plague of sin, no punishment, no ceaseless war. From wellsprings of eternal life, the fountains of forgiveness flow. Refuge of a thousand lives will crumble at the touch of grace, but your Redeemer will appear with light and mercy in his face. The streams of peace will wash the world with a deep and fervent overflow. The tide of love will wash the world the streams of peace will heal the world the tide of love will wash the world the tide of love will heal the world the tide of love will wash the world Streams of peace will wash the world. Well, thank you so much for, for listening. And now we're going to hear some inspired, inspired thought. And I will be, I will be back with you uh, later. Thank you, Andrew. I know he's over in the UK watching us on a live stream, so let's give him a round of applause. Thanks everybody for taking your Memorial Day Saturday to come join us at almost sunny Lake Tahoe. A few clouds out there. It was 43 down in Genoa this morning when I got up. Um, again, thank you for making the effort to be here. What happened to my mic? There it is. Um, we're pleased today to share with you some insightful thoughts on Christian science. We have two very skilled practitioners and board of lectureship members to share with us. They'll be talking about the writings of Mary Baker Eddy, mostly her principal work, which is science and health with key to the scripture. And I won't do my joke about keys. Um, if you don't have a copy, and for those online, if you don't have a copy and would like one, uh, email us at First Church. It's the word first and the word church, slt dot gmail dot, or slt at gmail dot com, and we'll get one out to you. And if you in the audience need one or want to take one to share with a friend, we have a supply out in the hallway. And if we run out, if you give us your name and number, we'll make sure you get one. The book starts out, to those leaning on the sustaining infinite, today is big with blessing. Excuse me. Today is. We're pleased today to first have, from Dallas, Texas, Patricia Woodard and her husband Woody, who's been very helpful to us as well, uh, to prepare for this. We'd also like to express at the front end our Appreciation to Brandy Brown and her crew with Tahoe Production House, who help us with all of the technical stuff to make this available for us here and for the 187 people she just told me were had hit our site already in a steady 123 and probably increasing. So with that, Patricia, to the stage. <laughs> Thank you. Um, 
again, um, everyone for being here. Um, each one of your thought in these times really makes a huge difference. And coming together and listening to Andrew's music um, just reminds one how walls come tumbling down. They come tumbling down together. But that, I'm just reminded, I'm just reminded again and again how important one person is. We see it in our own, in our own history. We also have seen it in the history of other countries, how one thought brought the end of apartheid. It's also how the Berlin Wall came down. And when I was listening to Andrew, I couldn't help but think about when he was singing, you are the light of the world. It reminded me of a photograph um, that's still just, it's just still in my mind's eye of people with, holding a candle, and they were encircling a Russian tank. And it's just the reminder of where freedom begins. And freedom and the wall coming down, it began with people meeting one by one by one in churches in Dresden, Germany. So thank you each for the light that you're bringing to the world today. I learned a big lesson many years ago about freedom from one tiny bird. At that time, I was a teacher naturalist at our local Audubon Center, which is in Greenwich, Connecticut. And in the fall of the year, when the birds would start flying south, migrating, and foraging for food, we would put nets out in the meadow. And they looked very much like badminton nets, but they were of a much finer netting. So as the birds foraged for food, they would fly into these nets. And unaware of them, their little feet would get tangled. And we would take them in the palm of our hand and untangle their little feet and would put a band on one of their teeny tiny legs. And that band would later identify them for future study. Once they were banded, we'd open the palm of our hand. They were free. And yet, there was no flapping of wings, no effort to fly until we would give them a lift and upward they would soar. Well, that got me thinking about how often do we feel trapped by such things as, as an illness, a relationship, a no way out financial situation, or or even by the, the news of the day, feeling helpless. So for the next 50 minutes or so, I'll be exploring ideas that have helped me and others be lifted up and free, not just actually, not just lifted up and free, but, but healed. I'll be sharing a healing of my best friend's son who was hospitalized for a very serious lung disease. I'll also be sharing uh, an account of a reconciliation between my daughter and me. And I spend a lot of time on this because of these times and what I learned through this about respect and, and listening. And don't these times need exactly that, listening to one another, exchanging ideas. I'll also share a healing of this same daughter when she was really a very little girl of a contagious disease while we were living abroad. In exploring these ideas, I'll be referring to two books. Joe showed you this book, The Bible and Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures by Mary Baker Eddy. Eddy, too, was faced with huge challenges that she was looking to be free of. She suffered for many, many years, severe invalidism. She also suffered huge personal loss. She was a widow in her early 20s. She also had, had lost a, a child. Well, she didn't lose the child to, to death, but the child was taken away at age seven. There was also the death of her brother and her mother. And also, you think you were isolated for the last two years? You should see a photograph 
of where she was living. You just get the shivers just looking at it. I'll talk more about Mary Baker Eddy and her book later on in this, this talk. The Bible, the Bible has been referred to some as a chart of life, a chart of life, something to navigate by. It is just full of inspiration and accounts of people who have gained their freedom by listening to God. And not all of these people are just superheroes. I think we have that tendency to think, well, those people, those times, they were just these idyllic types. No, they weren't. You know, I think we forget the fact that, that, that Moses murdered a man and, and others in the Bible weren't those ideal characters. There was, there was Abraham, and as I said, there was Moses. There's Joseph, and, and Joseph had his own peculiar, peculiarities. There's Ruth. And then in the newer scriptures, there's Mary Magdalene. Yes, yeah, she was a disciple. And then there's Paul. And what would Christianity be without Paul? And Paul is another one of those misjudged individuals. And then there's a thread that runs throughout the entire scriptures, and that's the Exodus. How the children of Israel had behind them the Red Sea, the Red Sea, the Red Sea was in front of them. At their back, there was the Egyptian army, and in front of them was the Red Sea. And yet, they were led to their God-given freedom by Moses. So we see that no matter what is at our back or what is in front of us, we can be led just like those children of Israel to our God-given freedom. These times today are a lot like Jesus' times. There, there was illness, poverty, social injustice, and sharp political and religious differences. And there was also famine and wars and rumors of wars. And then there was also the overarching power of Rome. And yet, Jesus had the solution 2,000 years ago when he said, you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. What is this truth that can lift us all to freedom? Well, fundamental to it, Jesus said, God is our Father. And he further said, call no man on earth your Father, for one which is in heaven is your Father. In the simplicity of this bold truth, there is a little word, one. One is our Father. Now, Jesus calling God Father was because of the attributes of God and his close relationship, our close relationship to God. It's not that God is masculine. In fact, the Bible also refers to God as mother, like in the book of Isaiah. As a mother comforts her young, so will I comfort you. So this one divine parent is truth itself, love itself, the sole creator. All things were made by him, by God, and without him, God, was nothing made that was made. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. These last two citations I just quoted from the Bible. So God being the only one, all, couldn't create anything outside of God's allness. Everything must be good. We learn also that God is spirit. So everything good and true and real is purely spiritual. So just think, we as his ideas, as God's ideas, the sons and daughters, 
have all the attributes of God. We're the very outcome, offspring of God. So the very substance of our lives is truth and love. So as I said, every attribute is ours. Now this is not a feel-good religious statement. It can be experienced. It can be proved. What it does do is it causes us to think and act differently. And this thinking and acting differently, this change of perspective to God and what God is doing, brings healing today just as it did in Jesus' times. These times remind me of a phone conversation I had over two years ago with my best friend. It was when COVID just first appeared on the scene and there were news things flying all over and different opinions. So I thought I would call my best friend, who is a medical nurse, that she would have a, a good beat on this and, and help clear some things up. As we talked, and she did clear things up, she reminded me of a healing of her son many years ago. And as she spoke about it and reminded me of it, I asked her if she wouldn't mind writing this up and if I might share it in a Christian science lecture. And she was more than happy to. So let me read her account of this healing. One Sunday afternoon, my son, who was 15 at that time, and I were watching sports on TV. Suddenly he said, Mom, I'm having trouble taking a deep breath. I looked over at him and asked him a few clinical questions. I'm a nurse with lots of experience, and my son can worry a bit, and I have learned to reassure him. So I told him it probably wasn't anything to worry about, and jokingly I added, let me know when it's time to go to the ER, the emergency room. We continued to watch the game. After a while, he turned to me and said, I think I need to see a doctor. In a short time, we were in the hospital getting chest x-rays and getting him admitted for what was diagnosed as a sudden onset of bilateral pneumonia. I was scared because he was receiving mul multiple drugs for a very serious lung disease. All the interventions were appropriate and I had faith in the medical plan. I stayed with him in the hospital for three days while he deteriorated. He was very sick. On Wednesday morning, I called Patty at 7 a.m. for the comfort of my best friend. Patty listened for a short time and said to me, let me get to work, and we hung up. 17 minutes later, after a particularly tough night, with respiratory staff on call for treatments whenever my son asked for help. He sat up, took off his oxygen mask and said, Mom, I think I don't need this anymore. Everyone was surprised. I wasn't. I knew where the healing had come from. Such a drastic change in evidence doesn't occur within 17 minutes. Something else was going on. My friend's prayer as a Christian science practitioner ended the crisis and brought the healing. Let me say, she said numerous times, we hard-nosed medical people know that a change doesn't occur like this in 17 minutes. Something else is going on. Before I share what was going on my end of the phone, let me clear up a couple things. We had been friends at that point for over 20 years. Whatever doubts she had had about the reliability of Christian science healing and care for children had been completely erased. She saw how healthy our children were and whenever a problem came up, whether it was something in school or an illness, she saw how quickly and responsibly it was healed. 
This also was a woman at the other end of the phone grieving. It was an emergency. So naturally, what would one do but pray? So when I got off the phone, I got very quiet, and I humbly acknowledged that God, infinite love, knows no boundaries, that love doesn't stop at a hospital door. I also realized that I had to get out of that room an uninvited guest, fear. In those moments, I realized that Christian science prayer is reliable. It's based on the same law that Christ Jesus healed by. In that law of God is all, Jesus saw the perfect man, that nothing could invade that perfection. So prayer isn't changing God, it's changing us. We see the realness of God, of divine love, and we feel the somethingness and the nowness of what it means to be a child of God. Also, also I, I realized that this, this is a law, it's reliable, it's not something that I have to muster up enough faith in. What it is, it's yielding to what already is. I spend a lot of time on, in airplanes, and I know very little about aerodynamics, and yet I know there's an underlying law that allows us all to fly, be lifted up, carried to our destination, and land. So this just gives you a hint of how this law of divine love works. So having established this in my thought, I continued listening and following love's leadings. And the thing is, God will give you just the ideas that you need in a way that you will understand. And so as I continued listening and following, I heard these words. In him we live and move and breathe. Now, those of you out there that are familiar with Paul will know that's not exactly what Paul said. He said, in him, God, we live and move and have our being. But at that moment, I needed to understand that this young man was actually living and moving and breathing this atmosphere of love. And you heard what happened. In a very short time, my friend called me back and he was completely healed and very quickly released from the hospital. This was really good news that we both celebrated. And what good news means, that's what the word gospel means. And what Christ Jesus kept talking about again and again was that the kingdom of heaven is right here. And yet with all that Jesus was teaching and and demonstrating healing, people still asked him, well, when is the kingdom of heaven going to come? And his response was, well, it's not low there or low here. It's within you. It's right here at hand. So this heavenly harmony is present right now. And healing in Christian science, it isn't changing a bad situation into a good situation or a bad person into a good person. What it's doing, it's bringing out more clearly what is already present. It's just like those fantastic photos that are sent back from a space telescope, and they're sent back constantly. Maybe some of you can remember what it felt like seeing those first in-color photographs from Hubble come back. I don't know about you, but until that time, I thought that the universe was black and white and shades of gray. But what those new photographs showed us was the spectacular color and form, and you could almost feel the, the motion of these, these galaxies and stars. 
And so it is, so it is with, with healing, that this change of perspective shows us more of our beauty and, and, and color and harmony, not only ours, but of others. And, and prayer can act like a powerful lens for showing us more of God and God's creation. Now, there isn't a right way to pray, but whatever, whenever we've tuned into and focused in on God, that's what brings healing. You may recall me saying that God will give us the ideas we need in just the way that we need them. Well, these new ideas, they're the Christ. That is, it's God in action. And Jesus was given the title of Christ Jesus because of how uniquely he lived his oneness with God. He told us again and again, it isn't about person. It's about what God is doing. So this God that is always with us is right here right now to, to show us what it is that we need to see, to see our entireness, our goodness. So this Christ is still present, still lifting us up and freeing us from, from fear and from doubt, ego, ignorance. And I think this is what Christ Jesus was asking of us to share this, this good news. You know, before the disciples were known as Christians, they were known as followers of the way. And their reward for following is what I had mentioned earlier. You will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. So this truth was revealing itself in healing. And for the disciples, this was just too irresistible not to follow. There was an urgency to follow. I particularly like the book of Mark, and it isn't because it's the shortest book in the Bible, but there's an immediacy to Mark. Mark doesn't wait for maybe chapter four, five, or six to talk about healing, you know, once it's been developed enough. Right there in chapter one, Mark presents healing. Healing, teaching, healing, teaching. So this radical teaching of Christ Jesus, it changed these individuals' lives. Wouldn't we want to do the same, so to speak, get on board? Well, this bold truth that Christ Jesus was preaching and showing us, he said it couldn't be realized with the same old thinking, that is, staying on the surface with our own preconceived notions, that it required something of us. And he said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent. Well, there can be a scary thought for some. But what Jesus is really saying is, it's really very tender. It's a shift in perspective. It's as if he's taking us by the hand and saying, you have thought way too long within the problem, and it won't get you anywhere. Go deeper. Look deeper. I'm showing you your oneness with your divine parent. And you are just as perfect as your parent is perfect. Albert Einstein, the father of modern-day physics, is purported to have said something quite similar. You can't solve your problems with the same thinking that created them. Sounds like repent, doesn't it? There's an idea that I'd like to share with you that I've found helpful in thinking about this word repent. It's an Italian word, pentimento. 
Pentimento is an art term that means getting down to the original masterpiece. In the days of the great Italian fresco painters, such as Michelangelo, they sometimes would paint over their original masterpiece, perhaps because they had a better perspective, or sometimes it was just time to redecorate the church. Later, later, Pentimento was still used, and, and it occurred again in the times of Nazi Germany, and I've been recently reminded, yes, and in Russia too, that people would paint over their masterpieces in order to hide them. So this getting down to the original masterpiece, the original masterpiece is God and his creation. Have you ever thought of yourself as an original masterpiece? Because you are. What gets in the way of us experiencing more of this masterpiece, having more of it? What gets in the way are such things as fear and doubt and ego and ignorance, the things I earlier mentioned. But if we want to get down to that masterpiece, then we need to do what Christ Jesus did. And he found the spiritual cause. And we can do that too. That's what happened with my friend's son. And thinking out from this original cause brings us freedom and healing. So every element of our health that is expressed in vitality, intelligence, harmony, purity, is present. It's ours. And so is our God-given, uninterrupted goodness of character. I had a pentimento experience when our daughter was still a teen, and perhaps some of you have too. It's a pretty challenging time for all, and if you haven't had a teen, you can certainly remember back to being a teen. As I said, it's a pretty challenging time. And I have to admit that I was the one that had some growing up to do. Our daughter had done something, well, the something was she lied to me. And for me, lying is just the worst thing that you can do. She had apologized every which way, and yet I could not accept her apology. And the more I thought about it, the angrier I would get and the more fearful I would get. It was as if I was standing at a copy machine and I just kept hitting that same button, you know, the one, copy. Well, what would come out? The same image. And with more hindsight, there was another button that I was pressing, enlarge. But I also had learned that if I just would stay with it, even though I was resisting, if I would just stay with it, that peace and trust would return. Several days later, still rehearsing, still copying, while driving, spontaneously, just from deep depths, I found myself shouting spontaneously, no, 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 she is the image and likeness of God. With that, a whole new view of God opened up and a new sense about our daughter. Remember me saying I had some growing up to do? That was one of those growing up moments. I needed to repent. And in that moment, I saw and I felt truly that our daughter was the image and likeness of God from all eternity, unchanged. I could hardly wait to get home and throw my arms around our daughter. She too was running towards me with some good news. And from then on, our relationship moved forward from a whole new basis. Now I'm not going to stand here in front of I don't know how many people and say we never had another mother-daughter disagreement, but it moved forward, upward, from a whole new basis. There was, there was discussion, there was, there was listening. 
let me add right here what was so distressing about this situation. I hadn't spoken to her in days. I felt done with her. Can, can you imagine being done with your own daughter, living under the same roof when you are learning about loving your neighbor? It just wouldn't work. So, so back to this experience. In those moments, I experienced the kingdom of heaven, harmony. No longer were those three words, kingdom of heaven, something that I just slurred over those three words or that I thought was bland and colorless. I had experienced the kingdom of heaven, harmony, and we can all experience more of it. What gets in the way of us experiencing more of it is this material sense of self that we think we've created it. We think that it's been our successes and our failures, our, our preconceived notions, or whatever the concept may be. But there's only one thing that defines us, and that is God. When I find myself doing that mental looping, I'm reminded of a psalm, and it's Psalm 100. It is he, God, that has made us, and not we ourselves. For me, it is a, whoa, Patty, it's a real pullback. Stop. This is not about you. It's about God. So see out, think out from what God is doing. So back to what happened. Was it just shouting no very loudly or quoting scripture? What it was, was truth revealing itself. And truth multiplies. And so what I saw next for me is one of those fall down on your knees experiences. It was just like dropping a pebble in water and, and that ripple effect. What I saw next was that all of her friends, all of my friends, everyone I knew, it just kept multiplying, was actually, was actually this pure, sinless idea of God held within this law of love. I also realized that I had been busily checking all those teen boxes, such as vulnerable, selfish, irresponsible, untrustworthy, and the list would go on. And there are boxes for whatever age or stage of life that we're in. And then there are the boxes that we just carry with us from one stage to the next. Um, it, might be, it might be victim. It might be alone. It, it, incurable. But there's really only one box one fact for us to check. So are you ready with your mental marking pen? Okay. Spirit made. This is our real identity, and it's anything but bland. It breaks through all those very same boxes that Christ Jesus did, those boxes of race and gender and class, and brings a newness to life, brings new purpose and home. So as happy as I am and was for this reconciliation with our daughter, what I'm most happy and grateful for is what it has taught me and how I can share this with others, that none of us are defined by our past, by popular opinions, or all those soulless statistics out there. One thing defines us, God. So no matter how small or how large the problem is, we can apply this same truth to ourselves, our family, our colleagues at work, our government, and the world. And as we discover our spiritual identity, we will we'll discover more unity, more love. And in that, there's a thinning away of what would separate us.
and we find solutions. Do you recall me saying that for the disciples, there was just, it, it was just so compelling, too compelling, that they had to follow what Christ Jesus was teaching, following. Well, this was true of me from the time that I entered a Christian Science Sunday School. Until that point, I entered as a, as a teen. I was exploring different religions, trying to get an answer to some questions. And I was like that far away from just walking away from religion because these questions could not be answered. They were answered that very first Sunday. And very soon after that, I had a healing of a broken arm. Um, and people have asked me after the lecture, so I'll, I'll answer it now. Well, how do you know that it was actually broken? Well, my mother was a registered nurse, which is why I never told her that I thought I had broken it until I felt that the healing was complete. And when it was, I told her she was predictable. In 15 minutes, I was in a doctor's office having an x-ray, and they were pointing at where it had been broken and healed perfectly. So from then on, it was just too compelling for me not to follow. I had seen a grandfather or, who had been an alcoholic for 40 years, and every other method had failed. That mother who was skeptical, skeptical about Christian science had things healed that she had learned to live with and were life-threatening since childhood healed. As you heard um, from, yeah, right, as you, heard, as you heard or you may have read that I'm a volunteer prison chaplain and it, it is just so gratifying to see individuals come from a very dark place to, to that light of their lives and, and turn their lives around. And, and, and some of those, and some of those who have been um, denied parole for 20 years, be paroled, it's, it's really something. The other thing that I would just like to add about being irresistible during these times is the prayer for children. For the past couple years, we've been hearing about what affects psychologically this um, absence of in-person school will have on children. We also are hearing about the effects of war on children, and now the effects of a shooting on those who survive, what this will do to them. And I, and I can say through our own family experience and that of others, that Christian science can heal all of this, lapses in school or mental depression. Okay, let's leave the present tense for a moment and go back to 1866. The Civil War has only been over for months and Mary Baker Eddy is in her mid-40s. This is already beyond the average life expectancy for a woman. She has also suffered a fall that no one expected her recovery from, and, and some didn't expect her to survive at all. But for Eddie, it was never too late to turn to God. Since girlhood, she had been looking for an understanding of God that would relieve human suffering. So for her, it was quite natural to turn to the Bible. And as she read an account of one of Jesus's healings, she understood how, the how of Jesus's healings, that life was in and of spirit only. And this led to her rapid recovery. For the next several years, actually for the rest of her life, she studied the Bible, wanting to know how this occurred so she could share it with others. And what she discovered was that there is a divine principle, love, guarding and guiding and governing the universe. Let, let me read from her own words. The lame the deaf, the dumb, the blind, the sick, the sensual, the sinner. 
I wish to save from the slavery of their own beliefs and from the educational systems of the pharaohs who today, as of yore, hold the children of Israel in bondage. Her reference to the educational systems of the pharaohs is a reference to the many years that the children of Israel were held captive to the Egyptians. But she's also speaking to us, to the things that would hold us captive, and how just like the children of Israel were led to their freedom, we too can be led and experience our God-given freedom. This was her motive for the next 40 years. In the preface, she dedicates these pages to honest seekers for truth. Aren't we all looking for the truth that will bring us health and, and happiness? Well, why did she call it Christian science? Well, the Christian is pretty easy. We're serious followers of Christ Jesus, who showed us how to live the love that is God. That science, I think, is one of those words that we bring our own preconceived notions along with it, rather than the sheer simplicity of the word. I found a definition on the, on the net that I think really has cleared up the definition for me, and it's this. The general purpose of science is to show a useful model of reality. Isn't that exactly what Christ Jesus was doing, showing us the useful model of reality that is applicable to whatever the situation is, no matter how big it is, wherever it is? I didn't always know this wherever part until my husband had accepted a job which required an international move. And before the move, we had all the required vaccines and we listened to the advice about food handling because we were moving to a tropical climate and we would be buying all of our poultry and, and fish and produce and fruit from open air markets without refrigeration. Shortly after our arrival to Brazil, our daughter woke up one night with severe intestinal pains. <clears throat> I got up with her, swooped her out of her bed and held her in my arms and sang her hymns as we've heard how, how they comfort and quiet. I also assured her of our love, her father and her mother's love, and God's love for her. She fell asleep and I put her back to bed. Before I returned to bed, I prayed, as you've been hearing earlier. The next morning she went bounding out of bed and off to school happy. The next night, this repeated itself, and it repeated itself for maybe a total of three nights. Until that point, I had been thinking of our family as holding U.S. passports that had just left what I considered a safe country, safe from crime, safe from, um, pretty safe from whatever kinds of diseases. Um, and what I learned that night was it's never too late to turn to God. So I had made up my mind I was not going to return to bed till I saw what it was that I needed to see again about God and our daughter. So I went to the dining room table, I opened my books up, and just started reading. All of a sudden, there was just such a sense of peace. And I heard one word, infinite. In that moment, I saw, I understood, God is infinite, the only power, the only one that everything expresses God good, that our daughter was expressing and living the good 
that is God. With that shift of perspective, all, all fear left, all doubt left, and I returned to bed. The next morning, she bounded out of bed, off to school, and that was the end of the problem. Although I never had it diagnosed medically, well, reading a Newsweek-type magazine in Brazil, a Brazilian version of Newsweek, while reading it, I w was reading about a highly contagious disease that children were particularly susceptible to, and it was carried by foodborne parasites. All the symptoms sounded like that, and friends also who had experienced this had said yes, and it takes about six weeks under medication to be healed. For the Woodard family, this was really good news. We, it was more than just healing our daughter. We now had a new sense of home. And in this sense of home, we were also free of all the things that other expatriates had to face. So this good news that the kingdom of heaven is real and present and can be experienced, this is the news that Christ Jesus was sharing with us. And through the lens of science, we can experience more of it. This universe of spirit is right here. It's not like the intro to Star Wars, like in some far off, soon to be discovered planet. No, this truth, this truth that we're all living harmoniously together, it's right here and right now. And anyone can practice this for themselves or others. I'd like to close with, I think, my favorite passage from Science and Health. Christian science raises the standard of liberty and cries, follow me, escape from the bondage of sickness, sin, and death. Jesus marked out the way. Citizens of the world accept the glorious liberty of the children of God and be free. This is your divine right. Exactly. We're going to have a little intermission. Andrew's going to give us some more of his original and original modification to existing tune music. Um, thank you, Patricia, for that. Thank you for expanding on it's Christian and it is science and the definition of science. There's a lot of people that get confused by that, and that really clarifies it. Um, the Both of our speakers will be available after the second delivery uh, to answer your questions on a one-on-one -on -one basis. We've tried to do Q&A sessions before and they don't work real well. Um, we tried to have people write down their questions and they don't work real well. So in person works a whole lot better. So uh, if we could uh, go ahead, there's uh, some snacks and beverages out in the, in the entryway that you saw as you came in. Uh, I think this next segment is 13 or 15 minutes, something like that. Uh, Brandy tells me we're pushing 300 people online, so uh, they've had some issues with sound that we've fixed as we've moved along, so we're getting the bugs worked back out of the delivery. So thank you again, Patricia, and let's hear some more from Andrew. Thank you. Wow, sir. That's wonderful. I So good to be, uh, as I say, the, the sandwich paste um, within these two marvelous speakers. I'm going to continue with um, some more music that will hopefully give you time to take in some of the some of those spiritual truths that have been shared. Ah, this again is another piece of music, uh, but it's by me. Uh, but the words are by that other deep thinker, Violet Hay. 
and uh, I hope you enjoy this one. It's all about freedom. I love your way of freedom, Lord. To serve you is my choice In your clear light of truth I rise And listening for your voice I hear your promise old and new That bids all fear to cease Still my presence goes with you And you do give me peace I love thy way of freedom, Lord, to serve thee is my choice. In thy clear light of truth I rise, listening for your voice. I hear thy promise old and new, that bids all fear to cease. For still thy presence is with thee, and I will give you peace. Though storm or discord cross my path, thy power is still my stay. Though human will and woe check my upward soaring way, all unafraid I wait the while, thy angels bring release, for still thy presence is with me, and thou dost give me peace. I climb with joy the heights of mind To soar o'er time and space I yet shall know as I am known And see thee face to face Till time and space and fear are not My quest shall never cease Thy presence ever goes with me And thou dost give me peace And thou does give me peace and love does give me peace this also fits in uh, very well uh, with this afternoon's talk we seem to be having a violet hay fest <laughs> This is a song called From Sense to Soul, My Pathway Lies Before Me. From sense to soul, my pathway lies before me. From mist and shadow into truth's clear day. The dawn of all things real is breaking o'er me My heart is singing, I have found a way I reach mine's open door and at its portal I know that where I stand is holy ground I feel the calm and joy of things immortal The loveliness of love is all around My heart is singing My heart is singing My heart is singing I have found the way My heart is singing My heart is singing My heart is singing, heart is singing. I have found the way the way leads upward and the goal draws nearer thought soars enraptured better lesson free the vision infinite to me grows clearer I touch the fringes of eternity my heart is singing my heart is singing, my heart is singing, I have found the way, my heart is singing, yes, my 
my heart is singing, my heart is singing. I have found the way, my heart is singing, my heart is singing, my heart is singing. I have found the way, my heart is singing, your heart is singing, our hearts are singing. I have found the way my heart is singing, our hearts are singing, my heart is singing, I have found the way. of love divine we live we move we breathe an atmosphere of love divine we live we move and we breathe Me 
they see it not Dissents that would deceive And atmosphere of love divine We live, we move, and we breathe We live, we move, and we breathe mortal sense we must destroy if we would bring to light the wonders of the eternal mind where sense is lost inside an atmosphere of love divine we live we move and we breathe See it not dissent that would deceive an atmosphere of love divine. We live, we move, and we breathe. We live, we move, and we We move and we breathe. The God immortal principle is with us everywhere. He holds us in his perfect love, and we his image bear an atmosphere of love divine. We live, we live, we move, we move, and we breathe. sense that would deceive an atmosphere of love divine we live we move and we breathe we live we move and we breathe It's in so perfectly. So I'd also like to share with you uh, today uh, a new version of The Lord is My Shepherd. It's a timeless uh, Bible passage, um, Psalm 23, and it's, it's suitable for so many situations in, in our world, as I say, on the on a personal level, on a on a neighborhood level, in our wider neighborhood level, and on the world scene. So, um, so yeah, this is uh, it's going to bring to a close this this little section. This is called "The Lord is My Shepherd." Lord is my shepherd, I'll not want He makes me down to lie In pastures green He leadeth me the quiet waters by His goodness restores my soul his goodness restores my soul. His goodness restores my soul. And I will trust in you. And I will trust in you. And I will trust. I will trust in you. 
And though I walk in the darkest path, I will fear no evil. He guides my ways in righteousness, anoints my head with oil. For you are with me, your rock and staff comfort me still. Yes, you who are with me, and that's all I need to know. And I will trust in you. And I will trust in you. Thank you very much, Andrew, for all of your work in pre-preparing for this, and we appreciate your contributions to the, to the new hymnal and to all the other music that you have. I think his website is andrewdbrewis at gmail.com. Dot com? Andrew G, Andrew D. Brewis dot com is his website. And... Uh, he has other compositions out there, inspirational music and what have you. So, Looks like everybody has gathered back into the room. Continuing with our smorgasbord of inspirational and healing ideas, uh, we'd like to welcome our next speaker, Mr. Mark McCurdy, who's from Ann Arbor, Michigan. Um, he's a sports nut, I've learned. If, it's, if it ends in sports, unless it's professional hockey, was that the deal? Not real wild about professional hockey or the other, the other way around? Okay. And college basketball, if it, if it involves a sport, Mark is a perfectionist and tries to do his best to be the, at the top of the competitive heap. So we appreciate you also taking time to come be with us today. Both Patricia and Mark have been here before. Um, some of you remember that, but we brought them back by popular demand. So, Mr. McCurdy's. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joe, and thank you so much for being here, taking some time out of your busy Memorial Day weekend to come together and to join in this important conversation, these important discussions that we're having. Really, I think in, in many ways, this is such a, a wonderful moment for us to be able to have a conversation about how we can bring help and healing to the world. Because I, I don't know if at any point in, in human history, certainly this is right up there with some of the, the most challenging and difficult moments in human history that we're facing right now. And essentially people are asking the same question everywhere you look. And it's essentially along the lines of 
how are we going to save the world? It's a huge question to be asking, but everybody is feeling at this moment this sense of pressure or burden to try to find answers, to try to find solutions to these difficult and disturbing things that we're dealing with right now in our country and around the world. And so I'd like to begin my conversation with you by sharing something, a statement of tremendous hope, a statement of tremendous strength and meaning and purpose for what we are currently living through during these difficult times. And it's taken from the Bible. This is the Gospel of John. I've got a copy of the, the King James Version of the Bible here. This is remarkable to me. It's a statement that Jesus made. And again, I think it brings a tremendous sense of hope for the world today. Jesus said, in the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Now, I think it might be hard for some folks to feel like this is a time when they can be of good cheer. But it is so helpful for us to appreciate the fullness of this promise that Jesus has given to the world. It's helpful or useful to note right up front that Jesus acknowledges in the world ye shall have tribulation. But he didn't stop there. He didn't just say that life is tough or the world's going to be a difficult place and there's nothing you can do about it. He actually offered a promise of practical help. The means to overcome tribulation, suffering, and injustice in the world. Now there are some people who would ask, why do we turn to the Bible as a place to find answers, as a place to find hope during difficult times. Well, one reason that we can turn to the Bible is because the Bible is a record that spans thousands of years of people who actually saw something of God's goodness, God's power, God's healing and saving love in their lives. And so the Bible is a place that we might go to learn more about God's healing power, where we might learn more about God's love and how it could actually bring help into our experience today. One of the main things that the Bible teaches is about the nature of God. For example, the Bible tells us that God is spirit, not a, a finite mortal person. God is not fashioned after mortal personality. But God is an infinite divine presence that each one of us can begin to know and to feel in our heart. The Bible also tells us that God governs and cares for each one of us, that God lovingly governs us through spiritual laws. And now we call God's laws spiritual laws because, again, God is spirit. So if a law comes from God, if a law proceeds from God, it has to be spiritual in nature. And no one proved the power and presence of God's spiritual laws with more consistency, with more dependability than Jesus Christ. During his earthly ministry, over and over, Jesus showed that the power of God's spiritual laws, the power of God's love, could bring help and healing to the world in the most wonderful ways. And he did that as he healed people of all kinds of terrible disease. I've often found it really wonderful that Jesus did that healing contrary to material assumptions and health codes that say certain physical conditions are going to cause disease. Uh, we just heard my good friend Patty in her talk discuss how there were these assumptions about what could happen when you went to a particular place and you were getting your food from a particular source. 
There were even material laws associated with it that said that could potentially cause disease. Jesus didn't operate according to what material laws said. He operated according to what God's spiritual laws say. He proved that those so-called material laws could be rendered powerless by God's spiritual laws, just as Patty and her daughter experienced through that lovely healing. Jesus healed or brought God's laws into people's lives in a variety of other ways, not just bringing a return to health, but he changed and transformed some of the worst kinds of behavior. Jesus fed the hungry. He overcame hatred and violence and malice of the worst sort. So Jesus really showed the might and omnipotence of God's love, of God's laws in all directions through his ministry. But I've always found it remarkable that Jesus did that healing work with great humility. He never took credit. He never made his ministry or his work about himself. It was always about the Father. It was always about connecting people to God and helping them to understand more about their relationship to an all-loving God. And then he actually taught his followers, he taught the world that with humility and with a right understanding of God's love that they too could see the power of God helping them to overcome tribulation in the world helping them to overcome injustice and suffering in their lives. And you know, it's helpful to note that in the 19th century, a deeper understanding of the practical import of Jesus' ministry was shared with the world. Uh, a deeper appreciation of the healing power of God's love, of God's laws, was announced to the world when a woman named Mary Baker Reddy, who as you've heard, discovered and founded the Christian Science Church, when she saw something of the present availability of the healing power of God's love. And she worked with great courage and determination to make that healing love, those healing laws, more widely known to the world. Now, it's important to note that I referred to Mary Baker Eddy as a discoverer, because that implies something significant about the work that she did. Mary Baker Eddy didn't just invent something. Christian science was not something that she created or made up. It was a discovery. When a paleontologist discovers the remains of a dinosaur, they didn't invent that dinosaur. They discovered something that had been there for thousands of years. That's what Mary Baker Eddy did. She discovered a fundamental truth about the way God has always been loving and governing each and every one of his children. What she discovered was that that remarkable healing work that Jesus did during his ministry was based on and supported by God's eternal spiritual laws. And that the same laws of God that were operating in the time of Jesus to bring help and healing into the lives of so many people are actually the same laws of God that are operating right now. Which means that any one of us can learn to better know and understand these spiritual laws. And we can still see them having a healing effect in our lives, in our world today. It was a remarkable discovery because what it meant was that the healing work from Jesus' ministry wasn't just intended for a handful of lucky people 2,000 years ago. Mary Baker Reddy saw that Jesus' healing ministry was the proof that God's love always governs our lives and that God's love can bring practical and immediate help. And as she was learning more about the healing power of God's laws, she also began to grow into this larger appreciation of what it meant that God was spirit. She began to see that because God is spirit and because God made everything that was made, it meant or it means that God's creation is spiritual. And that includes the identity of each and every one of us here. All of us have a spiritual identity that has nothing to do with what we think we look like in front of the mirror. 
And she began to perceive that a fuller appreciation of God's spiritual creation in conjunction with these spiritual laws could actually help one to overcome tribulation, suffering, and injustice in the world. And she wrote something about that in Science and Health with the Key to the Scriptures. This is what she said about the supremacy of God's spiritual laws. She said, we have the gospel, and our master annulled material law by healing contrary to it. We propose to follow the master's example. We should subordinate material law to spiritual law. So let me give you an example of some folks that I know who, who did just that. They used their understanding of God's spiritual laws to subordinate so-called material law or to overcome tribulation in the world. A number of years ago, a, a dear friend of mine experienced a severe seizure when she was a little girl, and it rendered her completely unconscious. And she was afterwards diagnosed with epilepsy. And according to this medical diagnosis, she could be expected to continue to experience regular seizures well into adulthood. And the girl's parents were told that there was nothing that could be done to stop the seizures, but that maybe through regular doses of medication, the severity of the seizures could be lessened in a degree, but they weren't even sure of that. And so here's a moment of tribulation in the world, a set of honest, hardworking parents facing a potentially terrible future of health-related challenges for their oldest child. But you know, that material diagnosis was not based on God's laws. A material diagnosis is an extrapolation of material laws. It's a, it's a set of predictions that's based on certain biological expectations. But if you read the Bible and you learn more about God's laws, you come to find out that God's laws are not material and they are not biological. They are spiritual. And actually anything that is opposed to God's spiritual laws, anything that is not supported by God's spiritual laws, can be overcome. That was the central theme of Jesus' ministry. It's actually the central theme that runs throughout the Bible from start to finish when something opposes itself to God's government, to God's laws, to God's goodness or love, then God gives us the ability to overcome it. And that's exactly what the parents of this little girl were going to have an opportunity to do. They saw that God's spiritual laws governed their lives like fixed facts. Now, what do I mean that laws and facts can work together? I say that in part because one dictionary defines the word law as a statement of fact or an outcome that always occurs when the right conditions are present. I mean, isn't that what a law is? It's something that always occurs as long as the right conditions are present. In fact, let me give you an everyday example of how this works. One fact that most people agree on around the world, which is hard to do to find a fact that people agree on, but one fact that most people agree on is that water is wet, right? Everywhere you go, most people are willing. To, there are maybe people who would disagree with that, but just... In case you're one of those folks, come along with me for argument's sake. We'll pretend that we all believe water is wet. What's a law that might proceed from our understanding of the fact that water is wet? Well, we could say because of the fact that water is wet, it becomes a law. It is something that always occurs that if we come into contact with water, we get wet. Right? I don't, that happens every single time. I don't know anybody who is above and beyond that or able to avoid that. We know that if it's raining outside or if we jump in that big, beautiful lake out there, we're going to get wet. We understand that because of the fact that water is wet. 
the reason that I'm sharing this analogy is because God's laws actually work in the same way. That means that if we can learn more of the facts about God and God's creation, we can see how it links us to completely dependable and totally predictable laws that bring God's power into our lives. So it becomes important then to learn some of these facts. The more we learn about God, the more we can see our connection to God's laws. And so what are some of those facts about God? I've shared a few. Patty shared many in her talk. That God is spirit, that God is love, that God is good, that God is the source of all life, that God is the source of all intelligence. The Bible doesn't just share information about God. It also shares information about us, about the children of God. It helps us to know that our lives, our identity, is really anchored in God's goodness. It's anchored in God's love, that everything about us springs from God's goodness. Those are some simple facts that you can learn about in the Bible. What's a law that might proceed from our understanding of some of those facts? Well, we could say because of the fact that God is good, because of the fact that God is the source of our life, because our, our life, our very identity is actually anchored in God's goodness, it becomes a law that health is a natural and normal condition for us to experience. Now, how or why do we make that connection? Well, because if it's a fact that God is good, if it's a fact that our lives are really rooted and defined by God's unchanging goodness, and it's good to be healthy, then health becomes a law that we can prove in our experience with consistent and dependable results. I think we would all agree that it's good to be healthy. And it's bad to be unhealthy or unwell. So if we can learn more about the fact of God's unchanging goodness, we can actually see how it links us to laws that bring that goodness into our experience in needed and helpful ways. So could facts and laws like these be applied in the case of a little girl diagnosed with epilepsy? Absolutely. And in this case, they certainly were. The girl's parents, they were Christian scientists, which just means that they had devoted their lives to a deeper understanding and appreciation of these spiritual facts and these spiritual laws of God. And so when the girl was discharged from the hospital, the parents made a decision that they would rely exclusively on Christian science prayer to bring about a complete return of health for their daughter. So they didn't use any of the medication that was prescribed and they didn't seek any further medical support or attention going forward. Now just to be clear, because there are some misconceptions about this, there was no mandate from their church that said they couldn't use the medication or that they couldn't have sought after further medical attention and support for their daughter. There, there is no such mandate. The parents made this decision on their own because they had actually seen the effectiveness of Christian science prayer in their lives and in the lives of their children. Now, if you've never experienced healing through Christian science prayer, this might seem like a hard decision to understand, the decision to forego further medical support or attention. But for someone who has experienced healing through Christian science prayer, through a deeper understanding of the very spiritual laws that we're talking about today, for someone who has seen healing not only in their lives, but in the lives of family, friends, sometimes in the lives of complete strangers, it's a very logical and reasonable decision to make. And in the case of these parents, they had seen the effectiveness of Christian science prayer. They had seen the power of God's love in wonderful ways, bringing help and healing to their family for many decades on both sides. And they trusted that the same laws of God that had been bringing help to their family for so many years, that those were the same laws of God that would bring help to their daughter in that hour. 
Because isn't that the fundamental nature of a law? Law is always provable. It's always consistent in its application, in its ability to bring about a consistent result. Another everyday example, take the law of gravity. The law of gravity is not having a harder time today than it did 2,000 years ago or than it did yesterday. I mean, nobody wakes up in the morning and worries that they're going to float off into space, right? Because we trust unfailingly that the law of gravity is going to do its job today. Now imagine if we learn to understand and trust in the laws of God with the same kind of appreciation that we do for some of these physical laws. These laws of God are even more dependable and consistent in their ability to rightly govern our lives than these so-called physical laws. And again, these parents knew that the laws that had been defending and protecting the health of their family for generations were right there to defend and protect the health of their daughter. Now, I want to mention a few things about the way in which these parents were praying for their daughter. And I think it's helpful to start by mentioning that prayer in Christian science is not about reaching out to a whimsical God and hoping that God feels like helping for the day. Absolutely not. Prayer in Christian science recognizes what the Bible declares is an absolute fact that God is an ever-present help. And so prayer in Christian science is also not about reaching out to God and then accepting that God's response might be to allow for suffering or injustice to continue. Again, absolutely not. Prayer in Christian science recognizes that God is good and that it is only ever His will that His children feel and experience that goodness in all the ways that they need to. Prayer in Christian science, then, is really a mental activity. It's the preparation of thought and heart that helps us to see more of the spiritual evidence, more of the spiritual facts of God's creation. And, you know, when we see and learn more of these facts about God's creation, about God's love, it reveals a divine law of healing that is already at work. So what do I mean that prayer helps us to see more of the spiritual evidence of God's creation? I'll try to examine that a little more carefully by looking at the way in which these parents were praying for their daughter. Their prayer was really anchored in a wonderful and fundamental truth about our relationship to God. Patty spoke to this beautifully in her lecture. Their prayer began with the recognition that God was the one true parent, that God was both the father and mother of their dear daughter. And I can't tell you how helpful that was in removing a sense of pressure from off the shoulders of those parents when they began to remember and understand more clearly that God was the one true parent and that the nature of our one all-loving parent is to rightly defend and protect our health and well-being. And they were praying along those lines. They were also praying to acknowledge that it was not God's will that their daughter suffer or be afflicted with disease, that such a notion would actually be completely contrary to the way in which an all-loving God actually cares for each and every one of his children. I want to mention, too, that the parents were praying with the help of a Christian science practitioner. I think you got a little sense of this from Patty's conversation, but a practitioner is someone in the church who devotes their time and attention to helping and healing others through prayer, through a deeper understanding of the power and presence of God's love that is always with us. And so together with the support of the practitioner, they were all praying to acknowledge that because God was spirit, because their daughter was made in the image and likeness of God, as the Bible said, that their daughter's true nature and character was spiritual. You know, I've always found that 
so helpful, that phrase, image and likeness, that the Bible uses, because that word likeness implies something important. It implies that the creation has to be like the creator. And so if the creator is spirit, then the creation is definitely spiritual. And the parents were understanding this in a new and profound way as the truth, as the fact that governed their daughter. And within one day of leaving the hospital, the girl's health was completely returned to normal. And she never experienced another epileptic seizure again. That was the end of that condition. It was a complete reversal of that diagnosis. And that took place after many seizures had occurred before being in the hospital, while being in the hospital, but upon leaving and learning more about these beautiful facts, about the fact of God's love, the fact of our true spiritual nature and character, that was the end of that condition. You know, I always find it so helpful, so encouraging to think about the eternal relevance of the scriptures because you can actually read about Jesus healing a boy of a condition that was believed to be epilepsy in a couple of the Gospels. And so if the same laws of God were just as alive and powerful in the time of Jesus as they are right now, then why wouldn't that girl be healed of epilepsy? And, and why shouldn't we expect to see further evidence of the power and presence of God's laws governing our lives governing our, our world today. This was the remarkable discovery that Mary Baker Eddy made. She saw something of the present availability of the healing power of God's love, of these spiritual laws that can actually bring help and healing into our lives. And she poured her heart and soul into trying to share that healing truth with the wider world. But I think there are still lots of people who would ask, okay, if God's laws really govern my life, how can I see or feel a connection to them? Because I've got a lot of problems. I've got a lot of difficulties that I'm trying to navigate right now. And, and frankly, I think in many ways, the world has been asking this question perhaps like never before, or perhaps not in a number of generations. With all that we've been faced with in the last couple of years with the pandemic, with now economic uncertainty and challenges, with labor shortages, supply shortages, with racial and political tension that seems absurdly off the charts. People are asking, how are God's laws going to meet the crises that I'm facing today? And it's a big question to ask. It's a bigger question to try to provide an answer. But one word that helps to begin to offer an answer is humility. Humility. What is humility? I can give you a, a simple definition anyway. Humility is a mental quality that helps us to know that we don't know everything, right? We don't. Humility helps us to be reminded of that fact. Humility is a, a mental quality that helps us to know that we need help. More specifically, we need God's help. Humility is a willingness to set aside our own agenda, our own opinions, our own plans long enough that we allow for God's loving guidance to come in and to be heard. And this is what's so great about a quality like humility, because it removes a sense of pressure. It removes the burden from off our shoulders when we feel like life's problems have become too big, too difficult to deal with. And again, I think in many ways, there's a lot of people that have reached this sort of saturation point there's been, there's been one too many problems, one too many terrible stories in the news, and people just feel as though they don't have any hope. 
or they have no idea how they're going to move forward. Humility is so helpful because it removes that thought that we have to humanly solve our problems or the world's problems. Humility helps us to remember that it's God's divine power and presence that can bring health and healing into our lives. Humility gets our own sense of ego out of the way so we can see what God is already doing to help and to heal. Now I realize that on the surface, humility is not considered a very glamorous or exciting quality. All right? Probably just the opposite today. It seems like most of the world is convinced that the quickest way to get ahead, the quickest way to find happiness or success is to assert themselves. And it's to make sure that they get heard above the rest of the crowd. But you know, that kind of thinking usually only invites human approval. It invites human applause and human recognition. But we're not really here today to have a conversation about how we can gain more human applause or how we can have more people be our friend on Facebook or like us on Twitter. The world has gone beyond that. The world needs divine help. And it takes humility to connect with that larger divine power and presence that governs our lives. Humility allows us to hear what God is saying. And that's essentially how healing in Christian science happens. It happens when we allow God to speak to us. But you may have observed, you may have experienced this, that it's hard to hear God speaking to you if you're more interested in speaking to yourself. <laughs> it is. And it's, it's equally as difficult to hear God speak to you if you're more interested in what the world is saying. If you're more interested in what someone on the news is telling you. If you're more interested in what somebody on social media has said. Humility makes room for God and for his message to be heard above the noise and the chatter and sometimes the, the, the raging volume that the world presents. This is what's so great about the quality of humility. It allows us to hear God's loving message coming to us. It allows us to hear the Christ message. Now, in the Bible, we learn that Christ is the Son of God. And so the main mission of the Son was still is, to tell the truth about the Father. Isn't that what Jesus did for three years? He told the truth about the Father. And even without the human form and figure of Jesus walking on earth today, this Christ message, this divine message, continues to speak to each and every one of us. And it's telling us the truth about the Father. It's telling us the truth about our relationship to an all loving God. But it takes humility to hear this divine message. And this is something that's really important. It's really helpful in terms of how we pray, how we reach out to God for help. Because sometimes without realizing it, prayer can become a very me-focused activity. Now we don't do that on purpose, usually. We don't mean to let our prayers drift in that direction, but sometimes prayer becomes very focused on self or I. But the true purpose of prayer is to learn from and to listen to God. We're not trying to inform God when we pray. We're not trying to bring God up to speed or, or help God be more conscientious about what's going on. God doesn't need our help. And in fact, the beautiful promise of the Bible is that God knows the things that we need before we even ask. Our job is to have the humility, not to say, God, I, I have an agenda and I need you to advance it for me, but to say, God, what is your agenda for me? 
to hear that message and to be obedient. And in that space, we learn more of those facts about God. We see more of that spiritual evidence about God and his spiritual creation, and it reveals those laws of healing at work. Now, there's a man in the Bible who learned a great lesson about the importance of humility. A man who learned about how in a place of humility, he could actually hear God speaking to him. He could actually hear what God was asking him to do. And when he heard more of God's message, when he heard more of this Christ message, it completely changed and transformed his life. And it empowered him to change and transform the world. The man's name was Paul. The Apostle Paul learned a huge lesson about the need for humility. He was so convinced that he was right. He was so convinced that his agenda was the only one that mattered that he completely failed to ask or listen to whether or not he was advancing God's agenda. He was so convinced that his agenda was right that he would literally beat people over the head with it. We see examples of that today. Paul's agenda wasn't any more right than anybody else's. God's agenda is right. And Paul needed to have the humility to learn that lesson. And so in a place where he found himself able, only able to listen to God, he could do nothing for himself. He began to hear more about what God's agenda was. He began to hear more about what God needed him to do. And as that Christ message came to him, it changed and transformed his entire character, his entire way of thinking, and it empowered him to prove God's laws on behalf of others. In fact, Paul wrote about that. He wrote a lot about it. I'm going to read one statement that Paul made. This is taken from a letter that Paul wrote to the Roman Empire. This is what he said about being transformed by Christ, having the humility to be transformed by Christ, and how it empowers us to prove God's laws in our lives. He said, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I love this statement from Paul because you, again you see right up front he says don't allow your thought to conform to the world. Don't let the world do your thinking for you. Don't let what somebody else says define and shape the way that you think. Let God define and shape the way that you think. Let God define your reality. It takes humility to do that. But Paul had learned this lesson, this need for humility. And he saw that when we have the humility to let God speak to us, it empowers us to prove that the perfect will of God is health and goodness and happiness for each and every one of his children. Now this is exactly what the parents of the little girl diagnosed with epilepsy got to experience. They had to first do what Paul said, not allow their thought to conform to what the world was saying. And that was hard, because the world had a lot to say about their daughter. But they got to a place of humility to the best of their ability that allowed them to ask one simple question, what does God say about our daughter? And in that place of humility, they actually began to hear an answer. Patty spoke to this beautifully during her lecture, that the only thing that defines us in this world is God. It's what God knows. It's what God is that gives shape and definition to who and what we are. And they learn more about their daughter's true spiritual nature and character, and it allowed them to prove, just like Paul said, that the perfect will of God is health and goodness for all of his children. 
you know, I, I think it's helpful to, to note here, though, that there were some larger underlying challenges that were defeated through the prayer of these parents. If, if you look at the situation on the surface, it was a beautiful return to health, a complete and permanent physical healing. But if you zoom out a little bit, there were some of these larger, more imposing issues at work, things like injustice, right? I think we would all agree that it is unjust for a child to suffer, to be afflicted with disease. Um, this was a, a, an example of victimization. Here was this little girl who had become a victim. Here was the little girl who was subject to random evil. Boy, what bad luck. But those things were defeated through the prayer of those parents and the practitioner. They overcame the injustice that their daughter was experiencing. They overcame the victimization that their daughter was experiencing. They proved that random evil is not more powerful than God's laws of goodness. And if those things can be proven even on a small scale, even in the healing of one little girl, doesn't that just point to the larger possibilities of good that can occur in our world if we individually and collectively learn more about the facts of God's creation, if we learn more about God's spiritual laws. That's the nature of a law. A law is always adjustable and adaptable to a wide range of difficulties. So if you, through your prayer, through your heartfelt outreach to God, whatever that looks like to you at this moment, if you can learn more about how God's love and God's laws can help you to have victories, maybe small victories over injustice, over disease, over suffering of some kind? Aren't we paving the way then for the world to have victories over injustice and suffering in a larger way? If it's true in one instance, it's true in every instance. Let me give you another everyday example of what I'm talking about here. We'll step into the arena of mathematics. A simple equation, 2 plus 2 equals 4. Every basic or beginner math student begins to learn equations like this when they're 5 or 6 years old. But if you take a 5-year-old, if you sit them down at a table, and you give them a problem that says, what is 2 trillion plus 2 trillion? Now it suddenly looks like a much harder equation. Boy, there are so many more numbers on the page. And because that child doesn't quite know enough about the facts or laws of math, they might not immediately understand how to get an answer. But everyone in this room knows that the same mathematical principle applies to that larger equation. Two trillion plus two trillion is four trillion, of course, every single time. The student just needs to learn more about the facts of math. They just need to grow into a larger understanding of those laws that can help them to answer the bigger equations. And as the student continues to advance, they learn to see that there are actually laws of math that help them to answer all sorts of difficult equations, sometimes huge or tremendous or what seem to be unsolvable equations. God's laws work in the same way. If we can prove that injustice doesn't have power over a little girl to sentence her to a life of suffering, we can prove that injustice doesn't have any power when one country invades another country and attacks them and starts a war. We can, improve, we can prove that injustice doesn't have to be the new norm when a student goes into a school and shoots the place up. If we can defeat injustice and victimization in our own lives, through our own prayer, we're pointing to the fact that God's laws can be expanded to embrace the world around us, the communities that we live in. In fact, I'll share another example from my experience of a time when I got to see how God's laws, they don't just impact us. They can impact and reach a larger community. So several years back, my wife was preparing to defend her doctoral dissertation. So she had to go in front of a committee, a group of professors, and defend years' worth of research and writing. 
And for many weeks leading up to this defense, she received great reviews about the content of her dissertation. Her advisor, these professors, they were t talking to her, they were working with her, and they said, boy, the content of your paper is excellent. We feel confident about your ability to pass the defense. But one day, before the defense was supposed to occur, she received the exact opposite news. Her advisor called her to say, boy, you know what, I don't know if you're going to be able to pass at all. You might not have any chance. Because a dispute had broken out on the committee. And so now some of these members of the committee, they were fighting with each other. They were debating each other. They were attacking and insulting each other. And it meant that what at one point was supposed to be a fair and impartial opportunity for my wife to defend years' worth of research and writing had now devolved into an academic brawl. And these professors no longer cared about the future of this student. They were more interested in settling old grievances and debating with a sense of ego and self-righteousness. So the situation spiraled completely out of control, uh, literally overnight. And my wife and I thought, well, the only thing that we can do, the only solution here is to pray. And we reached out to God for help. Now, like uh, some of you may have experienced when it comes to praying, I have learned that every challenge, every problem that we face, every difficulty that we have, whether it's a problem with the body, whether it's financial or relationship issue, every challenge really provides us with an opportunity to learn something new about God or to learn more about God's love for us. And so my wife and I, we were asking ourselves, what new and wonderful thing are we going to learn about God in this situation that's going to bring about a harmonious resolution within 24 hours? And we thought, well, the biggest difficulty, the biggest imposition that we're facing right now seems to be this idea that we are completely helpless that we have lost complete control of the situation, that not even God is in control of the situation because these people are in control. And now they can determine how much good we can or cannot experience. And we knew that that wasn't right. We knew that God is always governing. God is always in control of our lives. And so we began to think, well, let's pray to understand more about God's government. Let's try to learn more about how God is indeed in control of this moment. Let's learn more about how God and God's love are supreme. And we started to pray along those lines. But I have to be honest, it took humility to begin praying at that moment. It took humility not to be angry, not to be absolutely disgusted with that behavior. It took humility not to want to try to take matters into our own hands, maybe argue with some of these professors, debate with them, or to try to curry favor, see if we could get enough of them to be nice to us, that that would help us to carry through with the defense. It took humility not to want to say things like, can you just be reasonable for two hours? Can you just do your job for a couple of hours and then you can fight as much as you want? but just be fair and do your job for a little while. We wanted humanly to ask some of those questions. But we knew that if we engaged at that level, we would just be meeting the human will of others with human will of our own. And that wouldn't accomplish any good. Human will plus human will, here's another equation for you, doesn't bring divine help. Doesn't bring divine results you can absolutely bank on that equation. If you look throughout human history, human will, fighting against human will, never works. It doesn't bring divine help, it brings chaos. It creates storms, friction. It creates destructive elements. So the need is, was for us to have the kind of humility that allowed for more of God's divine power and presence to fill our heart. And that would neutralize the ugly elements in human character. So we were endeavoring to be as humble as we knew how. 
we were also really inspired by a lot of things that Mary Baker Eddy has to say about humility. She lived a life of tremendous humility. She prayed daily to have the kind of humility that would allow her to follow the teachings of Jesus Christ in the highest degree possible. She prayed to love in the way that Jesus loved, to forgive in the way that Jesus forgave. In many ways, the need for humility on her part was shaped by the culture of her time. If you rewind back to the 19th century, Mary Baker Reddy had to have humility because she was a woman. And that was a humbling station in life 150 or so years ago. She could not vote. She was not supposed to own property. She was not supposed to go into business for herself. She didn't even have a legal right to maintain custody of her only child because women were not guaranteed that right in the 19th century. And boy, if a woman had a new appreciation of God's love, a new appreciation of the healing power of, of Jesus' ministry, and she wanted to share that in a largely male-dominated field of Christianity, she was considered hysterical and completely untrustworthy. So her circumstance demanded humility. But it was through that humility that she began to learn more about God's healing and saving love. It was through that humility that she began to see she could not depend on human help. She could not depend on human systems, on the human apparatus to advance her cause or to help her establish a church. No, she was going to have to depend entirely on God. And that takes humility. But through that humility, through that dependence on God, she went on to found the Christian Science Church and ultimately a group of churches around the world committed to healing through the power of Christ. And long after the Christian Science Church was founded, Mary Baker Eddy wrote an article on a number of topics, but one of which was humility. And she said in that article that humility is a mental quality that helps us to overcome suffering in the world. She said in that article that humility is a quality that is indispensable to personal growth. Now I wonder how many of us today would have humility near the top of the list of qualities that are indispensable to our personal growth. Maybe it's not that near the top of the list for some of us. If I were to go stand on the busiest street corner in town and, and take a straw poll. Hey, what's the number one quality that's indispensable to your personal growth? How many people do you think would say, oh, it's humility? Or if I were to go into the realm of social media, if I were to go on Twitter and, and tweet out, say, hey, Twitter world, I want to know what's the number one quality that's indispensable to your personal growth? Who would it respond with humility? Who uses Twitter to celebrate humility? <laughs> or what about our celebrities, athletes, musicians? What about our politicians, honestly, on either side of the aisle? Who believes that humility is indispensable to their personal growth, to the growth of the country that they're trying to serve and protect? Mary Baker Eddy saw that humility is indispensable because it was central to Jesus' ministry. She saw that without humility, you're not making room for God. You're not making room for the Father. And then it's hard to experience God's healing and saving power in the ways that we need to. Mary Baker Eddy went on to write in that article that one can never go up until one has gone down in his own esteem. And so my wife and I, we wanted to have that humility, or work at it at least. We were inspired by folks in the Bible who lived with humility, many people in the Bible who learned lessons about the need for humility. I've mentioned Paul Elijah as another great example. Hard worker, unselfish, faithful servant, really committed to helping his people, the children of Israel, learn more about their relationship to God. But despite his best intentions and a lot of hard work, Elijah also made some mistakes to the point that he eventually found himself on the run. 
He was fleeing for his life. His enemies had sworn within 24 hours, which was the same 24-hour window we felt my wife and I were working against, that they were going to kill him. And this was a dark time for Elijah. He became so despondent. He became so depressed that he ended up hiding in a cave. He said, I give up. I can't do this anymore. I'm not good enough. I don't know enough. There's no hope. I'm going to this cave, and that's going to be the end for me. One of the wonderful things that we learned from this story is that God called Elijah out of the cave. That's the nature of an all-loving God, is to call us out of the cave. It's to call us out of the places of darkness. In many ways, Elijah was really in a place of, of great mental darkness before he ended up in that cave. You know, Elijah was angry. He was jealous, the Bible tells us. So Elijah was feeling violent, wrathful. He was scared. I mean, he literally put himself into a mental cave way before he got to that physical cave, which, to my thought, tells us that the way that we think can help to shape and determine our outward experience, which means it's really important to make sure that God is shaping and guiding the way that we think, an exchange that takes humility. But Elijah had lost that sense of humility. He decided he was going to take matters into his own hands. Really, it's remarkable when you read about Elijah's life in the Bible, it plays out along a very similar pattern. And God said to Elijah, Elijah, do this, and Elijah did it, except once, when he didn't wait for God's guidance, when he didn't care what God would have him do. He was convinced that his own agenda was right, and he inserted a huge dose of human will and ego into his work. He said, thanks, God, I'll take it from here. I know exactly what's needed. I'm sure that this is right, and it caused a storm. It caused things to spiral out of control. And Elijah needed to remember to have the humility to acknowledge that God was supreme. You know, we hear a lot about the word supremacy today. Elijah was attempted to assert his supremacy over these other people who were trying to assert their supremacy. The point that the Bible teaches or that this story teaches us is that there's not one supremacy and another supremacy fighting against each other. There are not multiple supremacies. There's God's supremacy. And it doesn't have any competition. There's nothing to compete with omnipotence and with infinite power and goodness. And Elijah had to have the humility to remember that God was supreme. And he didn't have to do that. So he learned a lesson. God was going to teach him. That's the nature of an all-loving God. Not only does he call us out of the places of darkness, I think in many ways we've been in a, in a cave for the last couple of years. God's calling us out of that to learn the lesson that God and his goodness are supreme. So Elijah learned this lesson through three object lessons. First, there was a rushing wind. Then there was a rumbling earthquake. Lastly, Elijah felt the heat of an intense fire. And after each one of those natural occurrences, Elijah was divinely led to the same conclusion. God was not in those destructive elements. God was not the power behind those destructive forces. And Elijah began to see, well, if God isn't the power behind those destructive elements, then how much power can they actually have? Elijah began to see they couldn't have any power if they weren't drawing power from God's all power. And Elijah relayed that into the next more immediate and relevant lesson. If God wasn't the power behind these destructive forces or these destructive intentions that were threatening to take his life, then they didn't have any real power either. And Elijah began to see that what was needed was the humility to acknowledge that God was supreme. And in that place, God's supremacy would take care of the resistance, the opposition to his good and right work, to his desire to share more of God's love with his community. 
The Bible tells us that God spoke to Elijah in a still small voice after this beautiful learning took place. And he, I just love that description of God's loving message, a still small voice. Don't we all want to hear more of the still small voice uh, amidst the, the ruckus and, and chaos that we see on the, the news in the world right now? To my thought, that moment guaranteed that Elijah learned a lesson in humility. Because the same still small voice that had been speaking to Elijah the entire time was now actually able to be heard. It's not that God stopped speaking to Elijah. Honestly, it is that Elijah stopped listening. He couldn't hear the message over the volume of his own ego. And it had to be turned down. In this moment of humility, he remembered once more that God was supreme. And that's what he was there to celebrate, not his own supremacy and not to fear the supremacy of others. He saw the one supremacy, the divine supremacy, that is God, divine love. And so as my wife and I were praying about this dissertation defense, we knew that the still small voice of God's love was speaking to us, and we were endeavoring to have the humility to hear it, and knowing that everyone else could hear the same loving message as well. We showed up the next day for the defense, and as other people began to arrive, their attitudes were not reassuring. The first person came in with a sour look on her face and said, you will have to excuse me, but I'm having an awful backache, and there's nothing that can be done about it. We're just going to have to deal with it. We thought, okay, that, that wasn't a, the most favorable exchange. And then other people began to come in, and they were angry. They were late. One man even came in. He put his head down on the table, and he appeared to fall asleep. After the discussion had started, there we were talking about a 400-page book my wife had written. And he was like, no, I'd rather take a nap. He's just completely indifferent. So we continued to pray. We continued to reach out and acknowledge that God's love was supreme and that God's love was the only thing filling that room. As we continued to pray along those lines, as we resisted the temptation to meet the ego of others with ego of our own, a remarkable thing happened because suddenly people became calm and kind and considerate to one another. And what ensued over the course of the next two or so hours was that one person would share helpful and intelligent feedback about the dissertation. And then another person would share. And instead of attacking or insulting or belittling the previous speaker, as had been going on almost nonstop for the last day, they would honor. They would recognize. They would even give gratitude for what had just been shared. And then they would share helpful and intelligent feedback and insight of their own. And that kind of mutual sharing, that kind of consideration and respect went on for two hours, at the end of which every person in that room stood up and had a smile on their face, and they shook my wife's hand because she had passed her dissertation defense. And then I watched as these people began to shake each other's hands, a simple act of kindness and dignity that I guarantee not one of them would have believed to be possible just two hours earlier. Many of them came to shake my hand. I had never met any of these people, but they were very kind and considerate in that moment. The woman who came in with a backache, she left smiling and buoyant. I watched her bounce out of the room. She was no longer in any discomfort. She had known my wife for many years in the graduate school, and she was just delighted. She was overjoyed at this wonderful professional milestone that my wife was achieving. And you know, my wife's advisor, <clears throat> who had made such a, a bleak forecast one day earlier, well, she was incredulous. She said she could not believe how kind the people in that room had been to each other. She said she could not understand what in the world would have made them be nice to each other that afternoon. In fact, she said she had never seen a group of professors in that department get along that well at a dissertation defense. She said there was too much ego and angry history in that department for that to happen. But my wife's advisor made a prediction 
that was not based on God's laws. And if something is not supported by God's laws, then it can be overcome. That's the central theme of Jesus' ministry. Every time something opposed itself to God's laws, Jesus showed that the power of God's love enables us to overcome it. It didn't matter if it was disease. It didn't matter if it was mental illness. It didn't matter if it was violence. It didn't matter if it was an awful weather disturbance. When it opposed God's goodness, Jesus knew that the laws of God enable us to overcome it. And again, there were some of these larger lessons that my life, wife and I learned from that experience. Things like injustice. The experience was, was totally unjust. Things like victimization. We, were vic we felt like victims initially in that moment. Things like people in power taking their power and abusing that power to deprive other people of good and right things. Now we see awful examples of that around the world today. And if injustice, if victimization, if an abuse of power can be defeated even on a small scale, because a couple of people were praying, it points to the larger possibility of what God's laws can do, not just for us, but for the community and the world that we live in. Because the same laws of God that help us to overcome injustice on a small scale are the same laws of God that help us to overcome injustice on a worldwide scale. We may have to learn more of the facts about God's love, but the ability to defeat that injustice is provided through the love of God, through the laws of God. And I think as we go back to the statement that I opened up with about overcoming tribulation in the world, there's a lot of people that would tell you only the first part of that statement is true. In the world you shall have tribulation. And I think a lot of people have felt that that's what's true in the last couple of years. But Jesus didn't stop there. That's the whole point of his ministry. We're not supposed to stop there either. That's the point and purpose of Christian science is that we can continue to see and know God's laws bringing help and healing into our lives today. We don't just have to settle for what the world throws at us. That God's love gives us the ability to conquer and overcome tribulation in the world. Jesus proved that beyond a shadow of a doubt through his healing ministry. And as I said, he did that healing work. He made that statement of proof with great humility. Never made it about some human agenda or personal glory or recognition. It was always about bringing glory and honor to the Father. And this is the remarkable discovery that Mary Baker Eddy made. She saw something of the present availability of the healing power of God's love, of God's laws. And she hoped that someday each one of us could have our own proofs of God's healing power that we might rejoice in. She saw that Christian healing is divinely natural. That it's really a, a law-based outpouring of God's love that's available to every humble and hungry heart. Which is why I'm so grateful to, to be here today, to be speaking to a, a room full of people, a, an online community of people that I know are very much interested in learning something more about God's love, about God's goodness, about how God's laws govern their lives. And through humility, we can learn more about those laws, about that love. And we can see how that love helps us to overcome tribulation in the world, not just for ourselves, but for the waiting and, and needing world around us. So thanks for having the humility to be here today. It's been a pleasure to be in Lake Tahoe. Thank you. Thirteen years from discovery to the establishment of a church. It's pretty remarkable. During which time Mary Baker Eddy revised, re-revised, re-re-revised Science and Health to get it 
to the state that it is today that we can use as our reference. The last hundred pages of that book, most of you know, are about fruitage, people that have gained healing simply, people that gained healing simply through the reading of that book. And in our churches, most of which have reading rooms attached to them or in close proximity or the online resources that get you into all of the journals and sentinels over the years where healings have been verified and recorded, all of those are in addition to those last hundred pages in my mind for the, for the uh, last hundred pages of science and health. So thank you very much to our speakers today. Thank you everyone for coming. Um, we hope that you've appreciated this cup of cold water, many cups of cold water provided through our church, First Church of Christ Scientist at South Lake Tahoe. I'd like to also thank our board who acts as the lecture committee and especially Cindy Cowan who has been instrumental in finding all of our speakers. So thank you, safe journey home. He that hath God is God even me Shall underneath the almighty shame Fear less than understood about Thus to myself of him I'll say He is my fortress my shield and my stay, my God in Him. I will confide His tender love and watchful care shall free thee from the foulest snare. From every harm and pestilence He over thee His wings shall spread To cover thy unguarded head His truth shall be Thy strong defense His angels charge over thee. No evil, therefore, shall thou see. Thy refuge shall be God most high, dwelling within the secret place. Thou shalt behold his power and grace. His salvation Heaven I See His salvation Heaven I See His salvation Heaven I Dear Lord, and 
father of us all Forgive our foolish ways Reclothe us in our rightful mind Pure lives Thy service find In deeper reverence praise In deeper reverence Trust like theirs who heard Beside the Syrian sea The gracious calling of the Lord Let us like them without a word Rise up and follow thee Rise up and follow of desire, thy coolness and thy bar. Let sense be dumb, let flesh retire. Speak through the earthquake, wind and fire, O still small voice of God. O still small voice of God. Drop thy still dews of quietness Till all our striving cease Take from us now the strain and stress And let our all that lives confess The beauty of thy peace The beauty of thy So this next song is a prayer that we're all very used to, and it's a prayer for every situation. And it goes by the name of the Lord's Prayer. <laughs> and this is uh, my version of the Lord's Prayer. Which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us deliver us from evil in heaven hallowed be thy name 
Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth, on earth, as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us, deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, the power, the power and the glory, the power and the glory forever and ever. Thine, thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, the power and the glory forever and ever. Ever and ever. Amen. Okay, this is uh, this is a, a hymn from the Christian Science uh, hymnal. Or at least the words are from there. And uh, at the bottom right, left, right hand corner, it has a little title and it's called World Peace. And uh, boy, do we need that right now. So this is a piece of music called Let There Be Peace on Earth. Let there be peace on earth Let it begin with me Let there be peace on earth The peace that was meant to be Let there be peace on earth Let it begin with me with God our creator we are family let us walk with each other in perfect harmony let there be peace on earth let it begin with me let there be peace on earth The peace that was meant to be Let there be peace on earth Let it begin with me Let there be peace on earth let this moment be now With every step that I take Let this be my solemn vow To take each moment To live each moment In peace Eternally There be peace on earth. Let it begin with me. Let there be peace on earth. The peace that was meant to be. Let there be peace on earth. Let it begin 
with me. Let there be peace on earth. Let it begin with me. Let there be peace, peace on earth. Let it begin with me. Let it begin with me. Once again, thank you so much for inviting me back for uh, second uh, year. Uh, thank you, uh, the Christian Science Church in Lake Tahoe um, and all the committee for the work that uh, goes into this. And um, thank you to the two marvelous um, speakers that we've, we've had today, just simply awesome. So I'm um, very honored to be here and to be part of it and I hope that my music has uh, inspired and um, left you with a sense of, of inspiration and calm and and love so let's go out into the world with that love and I'm going to leave you with a, a traditional Irish uh, blessing with some uh, extra lyrics by uh, Fenella Bennett's and this is called um, the Irish blessing so love from me to you in Lake Tahoe and to wherever you're you're listening so this is uh, it's been wonderful thank you may the road rise up to meet you may the wind be always at your back May the sunshine warm upon your face And the rain fall soft upon your fields Until we meet again Till we meet again May love hold you In the palm of his hand Take God's road and walk with courage Where he leads there is no turning back His love will shine upon your face And his truth will gently guide your feet Until we meet again Till we meet again love hold you, may love hold you in the palm of his hand, may love hold you in the palm of his hand, take God's road and walk with courage where he leads. There is no turning back His love His love will shine upon your face And His truth Will gently guide your feet Until we meet again Until we meet again May love hold you May love hold you In the palm of His hand her hand May God hold you in the palm of her hand